Two companies are working on bringing Australian astronauts to the International Space Station. Joining me now live to discuss this and the rest of the news from the space world is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, thank you for joining me this afternoon. So, so what missions would the Australians participate in? Well, so this is quite interesting because, you know, we, we've talked a bit about, you know, this private space race and, well, billionaires going into space. Well, Axiom Space is a company based in the U.S., uh, founded from former NASA astronauts, employees, even a former head of NASA has run this company. And what they've tried to or are establishing is essentially a company that does astronauts. So it's not tourism, but instead of being employed by a country, you're employed by a company to do that science and that work. And they have their first batch of astronauts, it won't include an Australian, but it'll include others, headed up to the space station uh, early next year. And so now Sabre Aeronautics has signed an agreement to say, hey, well, how about we try and get Australians into your company, Australians into your system, and then they can potentially participate in future missions. And this would be quite exciting because as of now, there's not really a way for Australians themselves to get into space aside from paying SpaceX or Boeing or, you know, Virgin Galactic, a lot of money. Uh, but also that's more of a tourism thing rather than being an astronaut and doing that as a profession. And this may give that chance of essentially finding a way to get Australians hirees or subcontracted into this company. Well, that was going to be my next question. How often would Australians get such an opportunity? Or by the sounds, this is the first time. Yeah, look, it could be actually quite interesting because, you know, Axiom Space already has four missions planned. Uh, there's two, uh, the first two already have astronauts assigned to them. But for the future ones, they are still working on it. There's no reason uh, you couldn't get an Australian onto one of these early missions. They already have agreements with NASA and SpaceX to work and get their spots in the International Space Station and get the rides. So they're kind of sorted all out. All out. Um, so if there's a way that an Australian could be employed, it could be quite early. You know, we've only ever had two Australians in space. Um, uh, Mike Scully Power and uh, Andy Thomas have been really the only two. Um, they also both had to be American citizens as well to go through the NASA program. This would allow someone who wouldn't necessarily need to get uh, American citizenship to because of that NASA requirement to go into space. It's quite exciting. And so you could imagine multiple missions and multiple Australians being hired as this, especially as Axiom Space wants to grow their reach and goals and projects in space. Yeah, terrific. Well, at least it's a start then and uh, hopefully yeah. more opportunities to come. Now, Brad, we've spoken in the past about a uh, space junk and now an Australian company is part of an international effort to recycle space junk. Yeah, look, yeah, we, we've talked about how much there is. I mean, there's millions of small pieces. Uh, there's more created all the time. And so how do we get rid of it and how we clean it up? And then at the same time, there's a second problem, and that is we have all of these satellites, and quite often they just run out of fuel. Uh, once they run out of fuel, they cannot keep their orbits in, you know, in the same orbit because they slowly drift over time due to a little bit of atmosphere. So they can't really stay up in orbit, so they need their fuel to stay in it. So once they lose it, that's that. So this this essentially supply chain has been thought of. If, if we can take and grab all this space junk and through a few different steps, eventually turn it into fuel to power satellites, that solves the space junk problem and then prevents satellites from becoming space junk. And extending their lifetimes means that the satellite lifetime is longer, so it's actually cheaper to run. You know, you're not replacing it every few years. Uh, and it makes it more sustainable. So a really ingenious idea that hopefully in the next few years can be pulled off. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely a fantastic idea. Obviously, it's been uh, such a big issue. I even note that mm. the US has said that debris now threatens the interest of all nations. Just how problematic is it? It is. You know, Space Junk, it doesn't care what satellite or whose satellite you own. And that's the interesting thing, because it's always floating around, and most of it is in that low Earth orbit. So between a few hundred kilometers and about a thousand kilometers above the ground. Uh, and that's where most people's satellites are. And, you know, not quite a hundred, but close to different countries have satellites in orbit. And anyone can be affected by it. You know, right now there's nations of four different people in space, so four different countries have humans in space. They are all at risk as well with space junk. Um, the estimates put that 
pieces bigger than 15 centimeters are numbered in the tens of thousands, closer to the hundreds of thousands. Pieces smaller than that, down to a centimeter, could be upwards of the millions. And you only need to be a centimeter wide, even if that, to create a lot of damage. You're traveling 20, 30, 40,000 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. You can imagine if you got hit by something at 40,000 kilometers an hour, it doesn't matter really how big you are, you're gonna do a lot of damage and this is the big risk. So if you can deal with helping to clean this junk up and then in turn create something that we desperately need and that is essentially a petrol station in space, you're really solving two big problems. So it's a really cool thing. Yeah. Um, and you know, nice to see another Australian company as part of another big initiative. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's obviously so important in tackling this issue. So good to see. Now, Brad, uh, moving on, on Wednesday evening, NASA launched a DART mission. Now, this will test the ability to deflect an asteroid. Take us through it. Yeah, it's been one of the missions I've been waiting for since <laughs> it was announced because it, it's so exciting. It's the idea of can we defend Earth if we find a hazardous asteroid? Now, we don't know of one. The asteroid being tested is not a danger to the Earth. This is purely a test, much like we do fire drills and emergency drills, so we know what to do and what works. This is what's happening. So uh, it will start, or it started now, a, just under a 10-month journey to reach this asteroid. And when it gets there, it's going to collide at over 27,000 kilometers an hour um, with 500 kilograms in the front to try and essentially create a crater and give this little asteroid a nudge. Now, it's not going to be a huge nudge. We're not talking about sending this asteroid flying. You're really just trying to get a, can we shift it? If you can shift it even a little bit, um, you know, even tens of centimeters or a couple of meters, well, that will push it enough if you do it early enough to sail safely past the Earth. You only need to nudge it a little bit, millions of kilometers away, so that a hazardous asteroid turns into one that sails safely past. Uh, this might be a stupid question, Brad, but would the I mean, how far can the dart penetrate the asteroid? I mean, would it would it cause damage to the dart? So yeah, so so this is a good question because you know this satellite is essentially going to be destroyed. You kind of know that. You very rarely build a satellite <laughs> to purposely crash it, but that's okay. This is what it is, is. But we actually don't know how much damage is going to happen to the asteroid because we don't really understand and have a great picture of how dense these objects are. Asteroids range from really light material and really rocky material to even some that are pure iron. So you can imagine if you, you were to hit a, a balloon, say you have a balloon a meter wide. Well, if you could hit it, well, it's a balloon, it flies away. But now fill that meter balloon with iron, it's gonna be really hard to move. <laughs> and so this is the big question of, of how dense these objects are and so how much impact we really can drive onto the asteroid. So the only way to do this was to know, all right, this satellite, this spacecraft is on a one-way mission, that's okay. We're not building it to survive, we're building it to do as much impact as we can to see uh, how much we can, so then we know what size asteroid, what type of asteroid, how early we need to do this, all those sorts of things. So it's the beginning of a process, but it's an exciting process, uh, one that you know hopefully we never need, Yes. But if we do need in the distant future, it's good to know we have it. Well, at least we know we'll be prepared in case That's we right. do need it one day. Brad Tucker, great to chat with you. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thanks.